How to protect yourself? Best practices. We divided this chapter in four parts. The first two will be focused on how to protect your devices and the last two will be focused more on your data. First, the basics. Let's see how we can protect those devices. And we're talking here about devices like smartphones, PCs, laptops, tablets, and the way they are connected with the outside world. The first is the antivirus and firewall. Probably most of you already use one, and in general, the most vulnerable devices that should mandatory have one are the Windows machines like laptops and desktops. It is highly recommended to use an antivirus, and most of them include a firewall as well, and there are some free solutions out there if you do not have a budget for a paid antivirus. If you want to go for a paid version, most of the vendors like McAfee, Kaspersky, Asset, Bitdefender, and so on, are offering licenses that can be used on multiple machines. So like that, you can also secure the other devices in your family, including the mobile ones. If you want to install one, we will leave a link in the document from the resource section where you can find a list with free and paid solutions. Now that your device is partially safe due to the antivirus solution, let's see what's happening with your data when it goes beyond your device. When you connect, for example, to a public Wi-Fi. What most people don't know is that this is the easiest way to get hacked, but let's see how this scam works. We'll take an example with Bob as a regular user that once at the airport connects to an unsecure free Wi-Fi network. Little does he know that this was created by Eve as a fake Wi-Fi hotspot to lure unsuspecting victims to join her network and enter their credentials on different platforms. The hackers achieved this by using locally hosted fake pages similar to popular websites like Facebook and they will grab your credentials once you enter them, including a possible MFA code or even more. This information can then be used to gain access to other accounts if, for example, you're using the same password on different platforms. Now that you know how you might get hacked, let's go back to see how the VPN can protect you. The VPN is basically a software that creates an encrypted tunnel from your device to the VPN server and everything that you access will go only via that secure channel. Most of the VPN solutions out there offer a Wi-Fi protection and when you connect to an unsecure network, the VPN will automatically connect thus protecting you from the unfortunate scenario that we just saw earlier. You will find a link with the best solutions out there in the document from the resource section. But if you are traveling a lot and using mostly public Wi-Fi's, you should maybe consider a paid version that offers, of course, better speed and connectivity. Now that we saw how a public Wi-Fi can cause harm, let's go back to your cozy home, your safe zone. But is your home Wi-Fi really secure? If you're using a more recent equipment, it probably is, since the hackable algorithms are not used by vendors anymore. But how can you check and make it safer? Well, there are a few easy actions that we can take. We are focusing our examples on the routers that are provided by your ISP. ISP means Internet Service Provider, and it's the company from where you get your internet at home. But if you have a personal router, you should be able to modify all the settings below. Number one, change the default login. Most of the ISPs are using a certain pattern for default passwords, and if that is leaked, hackers may have your router's user password. It is better to change the password of all the accounts you have access to. Number two, change your SSID. SSID means the name of your Wi-Fi network. This is due to the fact that your ISP uses a generic template for the name of the Wi-Fi network, like in our example, your ISP and the code. If there is any known vulnerability of some of your ISP's devices, hackers can just walk around and hack them because they can see the network's name. It's better to change it to something else or even further securing your SSID by hiding it. We will leave a link in the document from the resource section with a step-by-step -step tutorial on how you can perform that. Number three, strengthen Wi-Fi encryption. There are currently three main algorithms, the WE app, Wired Equivalent Privacy, the WPA, Wi-Fi Protected Access, and WPA2. From this, as in our example, you should use the WPA2. Or if your equipment supports, the WPA2 AES. This uses the AES cipher to protect transmissions and the encryption method that makes it almost impossible to hack. Number four. Turn off remote management. From your router, you should be able to turn off the possibility for remote management in order to not allow external users to try to use and take advantage of any vulnerabilities or to brute force your password. Now that you know a few things, let's move to the second part of the securing your devices. In this section, we will talk about software updates, operating systems and apps, how to avoid being scammed by fake websites, and why you should enforce the principle of least privilege if you have unexperienced users accessing your devices. 
Number one, you should always keep your software up to date. But why it's really that? Well, it's because this is the easiest way hackers can exploit vulnerabilities and gain access to your devices, accounts, and so on. When there is a major update that solves a critical vulnerability, the hackers will use it to find devices that are not updated and try to breach them using the information provided by the update. Number two, enforcing principle of least privilege. If, for example, you have different users that are inexperienced to use your, let's say, Windows machines, you may want to create a separate account for them that doesn't have local admin rights, and even further implementing some restrictions like not having access to certain drives, folders, and so on, to prevent any damage or accidental deletion of documents and software. Example, if they download an infected file, then without any local admin rights, the virus cannot do much harm. Number three. How can you avoid falling for a phishing attempt? Or how do you actually see if a website is legit? Well, let's see in our example. There are a few steps to identify, for example, if a PayPal link is legit. Number one, always check the domain name. Scammers are becoming more and more creative and they are using subdomains like paypal.yourpayment.net, which looks legit because it has the PayPal subdomain and the other words are somehow related. But in reality, it's actually not an official website. Two. The second step is a bit more advanced because it involves diving a bit deeper into your browser's menu. If a website has the green address bar or, as in our example, the lock, it means the connection is secure and no third party can eavesdrop and steal information. However, this doesn't make it safe. That's because you don't know who is in the other end of the connection because the scammers can register an SSL certificate on the account paypal.yourpayment.net and everything would seem to be okay from the browser's point of view. Fortunately, this information can be further checked and here is how we can do it. In our example, we are using Google Chrome as a browser. You can click on the lock, click on certificate and in the new window, check issued to. In our case, we should have there www.paypal.com which is the official PayPal domain and which means that the website is legit. If you have any other type of mixes, even if they contain PayPal, it's probably a scam website. You can find a link with further information in the document from the resource section. Now that you know a few things about how to secure your devices and how they connect to the world, let's take a look at your data. The basics. We will touch here four areas. The first one, how to encrypt your data. We will focus this on Windows and Mac machines. For Mac, you have the file vault that can be directly activated. And for Windows, you have the BitLocker that is available on most newer Microsoft operating systems. And now let's see how complicated it is to encrypt your drive using BitLocker. Can we make it in 30 seconds? As I mentioned earlier, this option is available on most newer Windows operating systems. But let's actually see how you can do it. You right-click on the drive that you want to encrypt, turn BitLocker on, then select different things like the password that you want to encrypt with, then next, next, start encrypting, and the encryption will be in progress. Depending on how large the drive is, it will take a longer or a shorter time. If you want to see all the steps, you can find the full tutorial in the document from the resource section. Next, how do you backup your data? Well, this can be done using one of the cloud storage solutions like Google Drive, Dropbox, OneDrive, Apple Cloud, and so on. If you're okay, of course, with uploading your data to the cloud. Or you can also do it locally, offline, using, for example, a Mac Type Capsule or other external hard drives with backup software embedded for Windows and Mac. We will provide a list with the available options in the document from the resource section. Since the backup is quite important, I will spend a few extra minutes here because I've heard this phrase quite often. What can happen? I have the new X brand, it's bulletproof, my data is safe, it was super expensive. Well, I should tell you a few stories that I lived. Once my house was broken into and they stole my laptop. Fortunately, my drives were encrypted with BitLocker and the data was synchronized with Google Drive, so I didn't lose anything and they didn't have access to my data. Also some years ago, I had many friends that were storing their data on external hard drives. 
they were quite cheap, but I don't really recommend it. Back when I used to work for a distribution company, I was often going to the guys at the service and guess what kind of devices were in a huge pile of broken items sent for warranty. I'll let you guess that. Nowadays the SSD external hard drives are much better, but still, I wouldn't rely on keeping your data on one single device, even if it's the most expensive and the shiniest on the shelf. As I worked many years within the IT department, I got some crazy stories on how data can be lost. Like the laptop was stolen, the laptop was run over with a car, forgot it in the rain, forgot in a train, dropped from the balcony, and so on. So to conclude this, always keep your data in at least two different places. And if you're using mobile devices, always keep an extra eye on them. And now, going back to our list. Three. As we saw earlier in the brute force section, we should always use strong passwords and do not reuse them across different platforms. We highly recommend you to use a free or paid password manager like LastPass, KeePass, Lockwise, and please refer to the previous chapter if you didn't watch it yet. 4. MFA. But first, what is this MFA? Well, this acronym stands for Multi-Factor Authentication, which is an authentication method that enforces the user to have two or more authentication factors to gain access to a resource such as an online account, application, or device. The multi-factors can be a mix of password plus a code that you get via SMS, voice call, or from an authenticator application. And now jumping to our example, we have two scenarios, Bob with and without MFA. In the first case, Bob is able to log in to his PayPal account using just the username and password, and in the second one, he needs an extra step an SMS message sent to his phone that he defined in his PayPal account. This makes it almost impossible for hackers to access his account, unless of course they have access to his phone or clone his SIM card. So now that you know what it is, please use MFA whenever possible. Some platforms already force you to use it, and this is the best way to secure your online accounts, but even your own Windows or Mac devices. Adding an extra step keeps the hackers away. Well, at least for now. We will drop a link with further details in the document from the resource section. And now let's see some further advanced tips. Further securing your data. My personal favorite, the 3x backup. What does it mean? It's having a secondary device in case you lose, break your smartphone, a backup SIM, and some backup MFA codes written somewhere or embedded in your mind if you have such a good memory. Having all this will give you a door to access your accounts if your main smartphone is lost and you have, let's say, MFA activated for your main account. Second, the screen. What many people don't pay attention to is that if you're, for example, traveling a lot and sometimes working from the airport or public places, other people may see some confidential or personal information that they can later use, like, for example, your account and what password you typed. Please always be careful, and if you're using a laptop, for example, you can also go for a privacy screen, so like that people cannot see what you have displayed at a certain moment. Third, always, but always pay attention to your personal data. Always double check before you enter this information. If you consider that some information may be too confidential, it's most likely a scam. For example, a bank will never ask you for the PIN code. Always set an alarm in your mind to pay extra attention whenever some personal information are requested. Last but not least, the communication channels. As you know, recently there were many discussions on the WhatsApp privacy rules and some messaging platforms were even cracked by the authorities like Sky ECC. Of course, there is probably no ideal app for communicating, but we will leave a link in the document from the resource section with applications that are taking privacy rules seriously. And with this, we would like to close the personal protection chapter. Now you know more about how you can protect your devices, how you can protect when connecting to a public Wi-Fi, how to secure your home network, how to spot phishing websites, how to encrypt and backup your data, best practices for passwords, and what the MFA stands for, and how it can be used to secure your accounts. As discussed in the slide before, you can find all the links in the document from the resource section and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask us. Thank you and see you soon in our next chapter.